Hello everyone, my name is Yu Feng. I'm a faculty member at UCSB. I'm also a co-founder at Veridice. My research is mostly on program verification, program analysis, as well as programming language in general. Today I will be talking about how to secure your ZK circuit with formal method. First of all, I would like to start by stating the obvious, in the sense that bugs in blockchain software can be extremely dangerous. And here, when I refer to blockchain software, this actually ranging from the underlying consensus protocol to zero-knowledge circuit to smart contract and all the way to the web free application at the top, including wallets, games, you name it. And if you have any logical bugs or security vulnerabilities in any of those layers, the attackers can basically exploit them and steal enormous amount of money. Here, to attach some number to this claim, for instance, a flash loan vulnerability that happened last April in Beanstalk uh, protocol, resulting in $182 million worth of crypto concurrency to be stolen. And that denial of service vulnerabilities in the Solana uh, protocol result in a widespread network outage, causing the Solana price drop substantially within even a single day. And last, but also relevant to today's topic, I also want to point out that bugs can also arise at the level of zero-knowledge proof, which is not very surprising, right? Because uh, zero-knowledge proof are written by humans, and we know that humans all make mistakes. And for instance, in this case, a soundness bugs in a Z ZK snap proof protocol can allow attacker to create fake Zcash coins out of nowhere. Now I agree that this might not be the best way to get started as a talk because this sounds a little bit depressing, but one thing I would like to get across in this talk is that bugs are actually not inevitable. And if we're using the proper and right formal method in blockchain application development, we can actually uh, eradicate majority of the bugs. And to adjust that, here's the outline of today's talk. First, I will give a quick overview about some basic concepts as well as terminology in formal method that I'm going to use throughout the entire talk. Then I will present two projects that apply formal method to ZK security with complementary skills, in the sense that the first project will align we apply lightweight static analysis that can allow us to find and quickly identify common vulnerabilities in ZK circuit. And then, so the second project will be performing like formal verification to verify that your ZK circuit is actually mathematically cor correct with respect to certain properties. And finally, I will conclude my talk with some uh, interesting future direction. Excellent. So what is formal method? In a nutshell, formal method refer to a set of mathematically rigorous technique for finding bugs as well as constructing proof about the correctness of your software. So to be clear, when I talk about formal methods in this context, I'm not just referring to a single technique or a single tool, but rather a class of technique ranging from systematic testing to the right to static analysis in the middle, all the way to the right for formal verifications. And I will talk about this in a bit more details later, but generally, the further you go to the right uh, on this spectrum, the stronger guarantee you can get. However, there's no free lunch. Uh, in order to get stronger guarantee, you also need to put uh, more manual effort. Now, at the higher levels, we can actually classify uh, formal methods uh, into either being dynamic or static. In particular, so dynamic technique on the left, such as fuzzing, can call it executions. They kind of like executing the program on some interesting input and monitor what happens, uh, typically with the goal of like finding certain vulnerabilities. In contrast, static technique on the right, such as abstract interpretations or formal verifications, they kind of st uh, statically staring at your source code 
and try to reason about the behavior of all possible execution of your program, and then try to make a conclusion whether your, your system is actually safe or not. In this talk, we are mostly focusing on static technique, including abstract interpretations as well as formal verification. To begin, so I want to say that we cannot actually reason about the exact behaviors of um, a given programs due to the undecidability problems of, uh, um, of, this, of this context. Like it's essentially we are solving a honking problem. So the fact that we cannot uh, reason about the behavior um, of the actual uh, execution of your program doesn't mean that we cannot reason about the abstract versions of your program. So the idea is essentially to obtain a conservative of over approximations of your original behavior and hopefully that it is enough to prove the absence of a certain bug of the correctness of your program. And to do that, we, call, we typically use abstract interpretation, which is a very popular framework to compute over approximations of programming state. Okay? So just to give you a high level intuitions about the insight of um, abstract interpretation. Here, um, let's use uh, brute regions in the middle to represent um, the actual program state. And notice that the shape is actually highly irregular in the sense that there was no way you can actually comp precisely reason about its actual behavior due to the unsightability nature. And then on the right hand side, we also have used uh, the, the red region to represent some bad state in the sense that some vulnerabilities or bad behavior that we, we hope that our, our original system does not have. And we know that it's very difficult to compute the actual behavior of this irregular boost uh, region. And what we can do is that we can actually systematically compute the over approximate of the original state using the green region. Okay, so in this case, you can think of the green region is used to over approximate original behavior of the blue region. And in this case, even with over approximations, we can actually prove that uh, it is actually like uh, have no inter intersections with the best state, which is the red region. And in this case, we can we, we essentially have a proof that the pro our original program does not do anything bad. And uh, this is great. However, like the devil is actually on the details in the sense that in practice, how do you compute and select the right abstractions is highly non-trivial. For instance, um, like if you took a look at the abstractions on the left-hand side case, the over in here, the over approximation, which is also um, the green regions, is too cross green because the green region accidentally overlap with the red regions, okay? Which means that if you generate false positive that actually does not appear in concrete execution. And that's, that's essentially when we say that our analysis actually generate false positive, which is mostly due to the imprecise uh, approximations of our uh, like abstract state. Okay? On the other hand, uh, for the case on the right, the, the, the over approximations on the right hand side, it's also like undesirable because the green region here only cover a portion of the actual blue state, which means that if you actually generate like a false negative, meaning that if you miss like a critical box in this case. Now we get the intuitions, but how does abstract interpretations uh, actually work? Like how do we compute those abstract states, right, given um, a concrete problems? So to understand that, let's first review a simple concrete interpreter, okay? Which is essentially take input as concrete value as well as the code snippet that we want to interpret it, and it will produce some concrete output. And so given a very simple example, let's say our code snippet only contain one statement, uh, x equal to y plus z. And in this case, uh, it is trivial to obtain to know that x is going to evaluate to 3 if uh, y is equal to 1 and z is equal to 2, right? 
that's essentially a trivial concrete interpreter. So in this case, if you can follow the previous concrete interpreter, then I have to say congratulations, because um, an abstract interpreter works exactly like a concrete interpreter, except that it operates over abstract value, which essentially represents a set of concrete value. For instance, in this case, um, a, an integer x is essentially can have an abstract values of intervals um, between a and b, in the sense that uh, we say that x is actually great or equal than a and less or equal than b. Okay? In this case, let's revisit and use the same statement that we see in the previous slide in the sense that given a statement x equal to y plus z, and then in this case, if we know that the abstract value of y is within the interval of a and b, and the abstract value of z is within the interval between c and d, then once we symbolic evaluate uh, this expression y plus z, and we can conclude that the abstract value of x is actually between uh, a plus c and b plus d. Okay? So basically, as I mentioned uh, in the previous slide, the idea is to emulate all possible program paths by performing some form of symbolic executions or symbolic reasoning. So in this case, you might ask, how about complex, uh, complex program statements like branches and loops? So basically, uh, it's actually like it's the same idea in a sense that whenever you have a branch or you have doubt about which one you should be choosing, you just like a conservative assuming that both paths is going to happen, and then you just merge the outcome of different uh, branches and collect all the values along different paths. For instance, in this example, it's very difficult to tell like statically whether x is going to evaluate to 1 or minus 1 because we don't know what's the actual value of flag, right? Because flag can be evaluated to either true or false uh, during runtime. However, what we can do is that we can actually conservatively say that and conclude that x is actually um, hold an abstract value uh, that is ranging between uh, minus 1 to 1. It is imprecise, but it actually over approximate the original behavior. So abstract interpretation can be used to capture many nasty bugs in Web3 smart contract. For instance, as you, some of you might know that a uh, reentrance attack is a very dangerous uh, to smart contracts because it's actually enable an attacker to repeatedly withdraw user found without updating the balance. Um, for instance, uh, using this example to illustrate. So here we have the victim contract on the right-hand side as well as the attacker contract on the left-hand side. In this case, the victim contract has a restore function, and then the function is trying to uh, transfer a certain amount using the external call. However, so every time it, it, it involves the external call, and then so it will automatically trigger the anonymous uh, callback functions, and then this function happened to be one of the functions of the attacker. So in that case, the attacker can actually call this restore function and re-enter this function again to make another external call without updating the balance of the account. What does that mean? Meaning that um, so the attacker can actually create dozens and hundreds of tokens out of nowhere. So how do we capture these bugs? So even though the actual business logic of the smart contract of that defined protocol uh, can be very complex, and uh, we can actually abstractly encode the reentrance behavior using um, abstractions such as temporal order as well as rewrite dependencies. For instance, in this case, we can actually statically abstract the behavior of reentrance attack by saying that uh, whether there exists an external function call followed by a storage update. Like in this case, like the code snippets on the victim contract actually match the, uh, the pattern we are looking for in the sense that they first make an external call, which is what stay here, 
and then after making the call, it is trying to uh, do a storage update. So if such case happens, which means that this external call would enable the attacker to re-enter this function again without updating this contract. So abstract interpretation is actually very effective in identifying specific type of bugs and vulnerabilities. And there are such as um, integer overflows, um, transaction order dependencies, flash long attacks, and there's a whole bunch of research in both, uh, and true in both uh, research community in academic, as well as industry. For instance, Slater is one of the probably most popular static an analyzer uh, that can encode a bunch of common vulnerabilities. And the Vanguard, like a framework, can also enable the attacker um, or the, the smart content developer to essentially encode and capture fractional attack. So, abstract interpretation is very effective in identifying specific type of bugs and vulnerabilities. However, it cannot guarantee your program is free from logical errors. Okay? So, which mean, uh, what does that mean? Meaning that, let's say, if you have a piece of functions that you want to compute, and then you want to reason about whether your function was actually compute um, as your original intended behavior, like you cannot do that, like using abstract interpretations. And here, that's where we need like formal verification. However, to use formal verifications, a prerequisite is to provide a formal specification to describe what's the intended behavior. Well, so what do I mean by formal verifications? Well, that is essentially um, a, a mathematical precise description of the intended program behavior, typically in some form of logic, such as uh, first order logics or temporal logic. For instance, if you want to implement a DeFi protocol and then you want to express the correctness of an auction behavior, Okay, and then here you can actually write the correctness behavior of your auctions protocol using the temporal specifications on the left hand side. And if you cannot understand what the specification is, it's, it is about that's completely fine because that's essentially not the purpose of today's talk. So basically, what the specification is trying to express in English is that. Um, so imagine I'm I'm a participant of the auction protocol. Um, so in this case, no matter what happens, if I didn't win the bid, okay, if I'm not the winner eventually, then I should eventually get my money back, right? Because that's essentially like an invariance I should always maintain regardless like what happens and how it is going to execute and who it's going to interact with. So a formal verification tool, which we usually call it as a program verifier, has different meanings. Um, as the verifier in ZK protocol. So from a high level uh, perspective, a formal verifier take the following input, the source or bytecode of the target program, uh, specifications that formally describe the property to be verified, and there are other like optional annotations such as loop invariance, contract invariance, or like some actual domain like knowledge and lemmas. So once um, the, from the program verifier take those inputs, if you uh, compile those inputs into a logical formula using a component called verification condition generator. We also call it VC generator. And the VC generator ensure that the code satisfies the specifications if and only if the generated formula is valid. And the validity checking is typically done through an um, off-the-shelf like a theory prover, such as SMT solver, Z3, CVC4, or like some kind of interactive theory prover, such as Cog, Lean prover, etc. And in the end, so the formal verifier is going to produce a yes or no answer. And for the for the yes case in which the tool was successfully able to prove the specifications, it basically mathematically guaranteed that the program matched the desired behavior. 
So as I mentioned earlier, so VC generator, like the verification condition generator, acts like a compiler that output logical formula. So here is a simple but concrete example to illustrate the basic idea behind it. Suppose we have a function foo that assign different constants to x and y. Okay, we assign 10 to x and 5 to y. And then at the end, we want to assert that x is greater than 0. So once you pass those programs, as well as the specification, in this case, uh, we use assertion as its corresponding specifications. So the VC generator is going to compile uh, these information and then generate its corresponding uh, first uh, formula in first order logic. So basically what this formula is saying that, um, so if x is equal to 10 and y is equal to 5, then it is going to imply that x is going to greater than 0. Okay. So now, in order to formally verify that this assertion always true, so basically um, the formal verify is going to reduce the, the problem to checking whether this formula is actually valid or not. Valid in the sense that no matter what happens, how you're going to execute these programs, so this formula should always uh, going to be true. And in this case, we know that this assertion always holds if and only if f is valid. So formal verification is very nice because it essentially gives the strongest guarantee when the proof succeeds. <laughs> However, due to, again, the undecidability nature of formal verifier, when the proof failed, um, it could belong to one of the following cases. The first case is that uh, we did uh, found a logical error in the sense that this is a true positive. And the second case could be, uh, while the proof doesn't proceed, it's because we need like a actual human input, such as loop invariance, such as missing lemmas, um, such as like, uh, like additional, like a contra invariance, etc. So the last case, which is also quite common, especially in the context of uh, ZK, is due to the incompleteness as well as the capabilities of existing theory prover. Like for instance, in the previous uh, like uh, figure, we showed that it's essentially when you invoke a formal verifier, it's essentially delegate the job to an off-the-shelf theory prover. However, so existing uh, theory provers such as SMT solver like Z3 can only handle simple linear integer arithmetic, but as we seen, like uh, in the in the in the follow up uh, part of the talk, so in the existing solver we will basically choke for reasoning about like a nonlinear arithmetic, as well as like a large prime over uh, finite fields, which are is essentially everywhere in zk circuit. So another thing I want to point out that there are many different flavor of formal verifications, and so far. Uh, we talk about unbounded verifications um, by default, in which uh, we try to reason about the space of all possible behavior of the software. However, this could be extremely challenging in practice because that we also require actual like manual effort and actual human input. So another um, options in practice. Uh, is that you can also choose to weaken your guarantee using uh, bounding verifications. So, which are pretty common in real-world form verification too. For instance, um, if you can uh, like restrict your input size um, to a certain degree or you restrict the space of your input. Or sometimes, let's say you have a complex program with a whole bunch of loops in which you don't even know how much iteration, how many iteration is going to run and whether the loop is going to even terminate. So in this case, you can always, like assuming that the loop is going to like execute under a certain constant. Like for instance, you execute your loop like just twice um, for every program that you encounter. So like what we've seen um, in the static analysis case before, so there's also a whole bunch of form verification too in the space of uh, smart contract and Web3. And for instance, um, we have Satora Prover, Kane Framework from runtime verifications. We also have Mithril, Selfish, etc. 
Now, we just show that if you do write a formal verification, um, so there are actually formal uh, like verification technique that can like check programs against the pro provided specifications, which is pretty cool, right? Because it's essentially you can use formal verification to find or prove the absence of any bugs or like vulnerability in your programs as long as you can write a formal specification to specify the bugs you want to check. And, there, and in this case, the downside is that it actually requires like a lot of manual effort for writing specifications. On the other hand, if you don't want to like provide like such kind of inputs in terms of specifications, and you can use other kind of static analysis techniques such as abstract interpretation that I mentioned earlier in a sense that it will allow us to look for certain kind of vulnerabilities. And it doesn't require any specification because those like no vulnerabilities are already in code as a part of the analysis in the abstract interpretation, such as the example we seen uh, earlier, such as reentrance attack, integer overflow, flash on attack, etc. Excellent. That actually concludes my presentation in section one. So to recap quickly, so what we have done in section one is that I briefly introduced uh, some basic terminology as well as concepts in formal method. And I particularly introduced like two different flavor of static analysis. One is based on abstract interpretations and the second based on formal verification. And we also review their pros and cons as well as their trade-off in practice. So with those powerful weapons on hands, we are able to continue our journey, and then we are going to see how we can actually use those techniques to ensure the robustness of our ZK circuit. Let's continue. So in this section, I'm going to start by review some basic components of a typical ZK circuit. So here I want to point out that um, even though you might observe that most of the example as well as um, evaluations are based on CERCOM and HALO2, so our te underlying technique was actually language agnostic in a sense that our technique was actually based on the semantics of the circuit as well as the proven systems, not based on the syntax feature of the ZKDSL. So which means that with sufficient amount of engineering effort, um, the presented technique should be able to extend it to other DSL and proven system as well. So we are going to um, first get started by share some basic components in ZK as well. And then I'm going to share a taxonomy of ZK bugs based on our large scale study on the existing popular ZK projects. And then finally, we are going to propose a system based on abstract interpretations, which allow us to quickly identify those vulnerabilities from large scale like ZK projects. To start, I will give a brief introduction of how CK circuit uh, is constructed and how it works. So first, the developer write their design programs in the source uh, languages in, let's say, CERCOM or HALO2. So the source code uh, consists of two components, the witness computations as well as the constraint. So here, the, the program is then compiled into two parts. The witness generator, which is obtained by um, translate the original witness computations, as well as uh, polynomial field equations. So here, the polynomial field equation, you can think of it's a set of quadratic equations over input, output, as well as intermediate variables that appear in your ZK circuit. And finally, the reason that we need those kind of polynomial field equation is that those equations will be transformed into zk snark which is comprised of a prover as well as a verifier. So notice that here the verifier in zk snark is different from the program verifier that introduced um, in the previous sections. Okay. So here, a key challenge for ZK developer is that uh, writing their design programs requiring writing both witness generation code as well as maintaining a set of constraints which are used by the compiler to produce a polynomial equation. And in order to um, write a correct ZK program, um, the witness generations as well as the constraints should be equivalent. 
And what do we mean for those weakening generations as well as constrained uh, to be equivalent? So let me define that uh, formally. Okay. So here, let me introduce some notations. Let's use a program P on the left-hand side to uh, represent a witness generation code. Okay. And here, the program P is going to take input as some input uh, variable X, and then it's going to return some output uh, variable Y. And then, furthermore, we are going to use uh, capital C to represent a system of constraint over X and Y. Okay? And then here, the constraint is constructed in a way such that for some concrete assignment of X and Y, so the constraint system C is going to uh, produce true if it is satisfiable or false otherwise. So given these definitions, what does it mean for a, a program P as well as a constraint C to be equivalent? So formally speaking, we say that P and C are equivalent if for any input X to P, such that P of X is going to equal to Y, and X and Y also satisfy constraint system C. Okay? In other words, the definitions come into two requirements. Okay? So first, for any input-output pair of uh, the witness computation uh, program P, it must satisfy um, the set of constraint systems on capital C. Okay? And then similarly, the second requirement states that for any pair of X and Y, which already satisfy the constraint system C, it also be a valid input-output pair of the original program P, which essentially does the witness generations. So the important question is that how can this be violated? It's actually feasible that those get violated. So we are going to like, uh, like look into this kind of possible violations in a bit formal way. And then we are going to break down the violations of this equivalences uh, property into two classes, since it actually involves like two parties. So, once, um, so on one side, we have the first type of violations, which is what we refer as an over-constrained box. And which happens when there is some input-output uh, pair of the programs, okay, valid input-output pair, uh, pair that satisfy the witness computation P. However, it does not satisfy um, the constraint system C. Okay. So in this case, we call it as an over-constraint. However, in practice, uh, we barely see such kind of over-constraint bugs and it was mostly due to two reasons. And first, like uh, the ZK developer, they are not incentivized to like uh, over constrain um, their variables in the circuit because like uh, the proof generations actually like uh, it's costly. Okay, and most importantly, so in most ZK programming languages such as Circom and Halo Two. So those few equations and constraints are actually encode as assertions to the circuit. So which means that once um, an over-constrained bug happens, which means that like it satisfies the original witness computation but violates those constraints, you can immediately see the assertions uh, during the execution of the circuit. So which means that a lot of them are actually being identified during the development phase. However, on the other hand, the second type of bugs, which is what we call under-constrained bug, is actually much, much trickier. So the second type of violations happens when there exist some pairs of X and Y such that it satisfies the constraint system C. However, so this X and Y, they are not a valid input output pair of the program in the sense that if you plug in um, P of X, so the return value is not going to equal to Y. So basically, if that's the case, um, as an attacker or malicious user, you can basically claim any bogus fact on some any random computations because 
those computations are accepted, are all accepted by the constraint system. And this box, in practice, is actually quite dangerous. So, and why do we care? So to understand this, let's review the original workflow of uh, ZK circuits uh, from source code to ZK snark. So in the, in the end, so the ZK circuit is going to produce a snark, which is comprised of a prover and a verifier. So which means that in this case, if there is an under-constrained bugs in the original source code of the ZK circuit, the verifier can basically accept bad input output pair that are not supposed to be accepted originally. And this is not just hypothetical like bugs, and this can actually lead to serious vulnerabilities in applications, including enable the attacker to drain all of the tokens of the protocol as well as allow the user for double spending. So how do we deal with those kind of like scenario, right? Um, because this is actually a fundamental problem in a sense that it requires reason about the equivalence between um, weightings computation of the ZK circuit as well as the constraint system. And before we actually dive into how can we do that using formal verification, which can provide the strongest mathematical guarantee. So let's take a look at like how the existing bugs look like and then whether we can actually capture some of the bugs um, with some lightweight static analysis. Okay, so from the previous sections, we know that a lightweight analysis based on abstract interpretations, it's very effective in finding bugs for like uh, known vulnerabilities. Okay. However, to use an existing like a tool like using abstract interpretation, as I mentioned earlier, it requires us to have some sort of like a prior knowledge about the patterns of the bugs. Like the patterns can either be syntax patterns or semantic patterns. So therefore, in order to tackle these problems, uh, what we do at first is essentially we first collaborate in, in, uh, through the collaborations from researchers in Zero Expo and Ethereum Foundations. We first like draw a taxonomy of zk bugs based on a systematic studies over large scale uh, zk open source projects. And here, so our taxonomy contain multiple category and each category uh, has several variants of the bugs that identified. So the first category is, is called under constrained signal. So as the name uh, indicate, so an under signals, um, under constrained signal happens when a constraint was evaluated to be true. And so in this case, so the circuit was able to is essentially like accept everything because like a, and then because there's no constraint over those signals and then here the signal can be either output signal or any public signal that can be accessed by by the participants okay and let's go over a concrete example so here uh, take um, a buggy implementations of non to bit from the circuit library so here, a non to bit take as input a prime field n, and then it's going to return its corresponding binary representations uh, using array of n elements. And here, every element is going to be either zero or one. Okay, you convert um, you convert a few elements into its corresponding like a binary representation, as the name indicates. So here, one thing I want to highlight is that, so during the implementation of the code, so the developer actually tried to use this kind of triple um, equal operator to indicate that, so they want to constrain the values of the output elements, okay? Basically for every, what this constraint uh, is saying that for every element in output array, it should either be zero or one, right? Everything looks so far. Uh, looks good so far. However, so there is a subtle of by ones um, errors in this case, in a sense that in this implementation, the loop bodies use n minus one as the loop bound, but the correct version should be n. 
And then if you actually combine those um, original circuits into their corresponding constraint system, as you can see, um, so using um, an element of size 4, so basically if you look at the constraint systems, so basically output 0 and output 1, they are all being like constrained properly in the sense that both outputs are either supposed to be zero or one. However, there's no constraints um, over the last elements, which is output two, because of the off by one errors introduced in the original source code. So what does that mean? Meaning that because there's no constraint over the last elements of the array, uh, so the attackers can basically pass any value to the last elements. And then, so, the proof system is going to accept it because there's no constraint that is essentially prevent from accepting this guy. And this can be extremely dangerous in practice. And the second category that I'm going to introduce is called unsafe component usage. So as we probably know that a big or large ZK circuit is typically composed um, of many small and reusable like gadgets or components, right? Just like you play Lego blocks. So why each individual components or gadgets may look safe on its own, okay? But a box may still happen at the boundary uh, because of incorrect assumptions. So that's what we mean by unsafe component usage, which include both under-constrained sub-circuit output as well as um, under-constrained sub-circuit input. And so let's take a look at concrete example as well. So in this example, the developer trying to implement the withdraw functions. And, and then here, the withdraw function, it's very easy to understand in the sense that you're trying to withdraw a certain amount from your balance. And then, so when um, so the developer was trying to implement the withdrawal functions. Um, it's trying to involve the less than component that is essentially compare against the value between the amount and the balance. Okay. And of course, like you want to always ensure that the amount should always less or less than the, the, the balance. However, so because the developer forget to constrain the output values of the less than return. So in the sense that the original, like the correct constraint should be added to assert that like uh, there should be an actual constraint to enforce the output value to be always equal to zero in a sense that, which essentially state that amount should always less than balance. However, because the, the developer forget about this constraint, which means that uh, basically there's no restrictions on the withdraw amount. And then as a result, the attacker can withdraw more fun than uh, he deserves. So last but not the least is the discrepancies between um, constraint as well as witness computations. And due to the design of zk -SNARK, so not all computation can be directly expressed as constraint in the proof system. So as a result, a bug can arise when the constraint does not faithfully capture a computation semantics. And then here I'm going to use a non-zero inverse as an example to illustrate this box. And then in, in practice, there's many, many such kind of variants. Okay. So here, let's take a look at a very simple circuit uh, which is essentially trying to implement the multiply inverse functions. And the function is very simple in a sense that it's trying to do the divisions um, between A and B. However, be because the division operator is not direct support by the polynomial equations, so the developer needs to construct and simulate this kind of division operator using multiplication. For instance, A divided by B equal to output it's going to be equivalent to you do a modification, you assert that the modification between output and B is going to equal to A. However, this looks fine, except that uh, he actually missed a corner case. In the sense that, so this 
will look equivalent for most of the cases except one corner cases in the sense that when b is equal to zero in the original um, witness computations when you do like a division by zero this is actually an undefined behavior that should be uh, rejected and that should be disallowed um, during the execution of the program however because you is essentially mimic this kind of computation um, using modifications so the modifications uh, that appear in the current constraint system, which uh, will actually allow b equal to zero. So, which means that in that case, so the the circuits and the proof system is going to is essentially allow some additional behavior that should be undefined in the original witness computation. And uh, so now we see the problems, but how can we like detect those um, bugs? That uh, why that might potentially like appear in in a bunch of like other like circuit as well. So and in particular, how can we like use like the abstract interpretation technique that we learned earlier? To do so, we first need an abstractions to quantify the key semantics of zk circuit. They are potentially relevant to our bugs. In particular. We introduce a semantic representation called circuit dependence graph. And as the name indicates, it's a graph represent um, ZK circuits where node represents signals okay, of different type, input and output. And here the edges represent uh, dependencies. Um, here we use direct solid arrow to represent um, data dependencies. Like for instance, in this case, if you have a witness computation that trying to assign I to O, then we are going to put an edges between from I to O, which essentially in, uh, encode that. So O, in order to compute O, it actually has a data dependence of um, to Y. And similarly, we also introduce the second type of uh, edges called constraint edges. So here, the constraint edge is represented as dash uh, line, um, and the the line is also the edge is actually undirected, in the sense that let's say if you have a constraint system that establish the relations between a signal O and I, so we are going to put a constraint edges to connect um, those two signal together. So now let's take a look um, at example and how we can actually use like circuit dependence graph to represent some kind of a key semantics of ZK circuit. So given the circuit on the left hand side, um, uh, what we do is essentially we first uh, construct node for every single signals that appear in your original circuit. For instance, you have a bunch of input signals and output signals and we are going to allocate a node for every single signal. Okay? And then we use different color to represent whether they are input and output as well. So once we draw the node, we also need to construct edges. Right? For instance, here we construct the data dependence edges based on the witness computations. In this case, uh, in order to compute the value of V, signal V, so it's, you are going to do a computation that require B1, B2, and carry. So as a result, so you can see a direct address that pointed from carry B1, B2, and both of them will point to B. And similarly, because uh, in addition to data dependence address, we also have constraint address. So in this case, uh, we are trying to establish a constraint that involve variable V as well as himself, itself. So in this case, we are going to put an undirect self loop um, to the signal uh, V. And we are going to do the same thing for uh, C underscore R. And this is the way that we um, up uh, construct uh, a circuit dependence graph based on the original program. So once we obtain the abstractions of the, uh, of the original circuit using um, our circuit dependence graph, we can reduce the vulnerability detections as an instance of query over the graph. For instance, this, is, this query at the bottom 
is to encode the patterns of under-constrained output signal that I mentioned in the first patterns of these sections. So we encode this query in terms of data log. So the detail, you don't have to understand the details, but in English, um, so what I try to uh, say is essentially I'm trying to make a query. And what this query is saying that I'm trying to look for whether there exists an under-constrained output signal. And in order to be an under-constrained output signal, what I'm looking for is that first, I'm looking for a signal V that is going to be the output signal. And I'm trying to check whether this V is constrained by some constants, okay, through in the original like uh, circuit dependence graph. And if this output signal is not constrained by any constants, and it is also not either directed or indirect constrained by any input signal, in this case, we say that we identify a potential on the constraint output signal. And now, once you understand those examples, let's group them together and see how a big picture works. Okay? We implement the proposed idea as a part of the Vanguard framework, which take as inputs of the ZK circuit, either in Circon or Halo 2, and so what we do is essentially we are going to take those as inputs and then convert them into its corresponding uh, circuit dependence graph, like what we did in the previous example. So after that, we are going to perform query on the generated circuit dependence graph using a list of query that represent the semantic of patterns that we learned earlier. And then finally, the tool is going to report any potential violations on the programmer's source code. And to evaluate the effectiveness of this approach, we actually um, collect 258 circuits from 17 popular um, ZK projects on open source um, GitHub. And the preliminary result is actually quite promising in the sense that the tool was able to identify a bunch of bugs. And among those bugs identified by the tools, it was able to identify 32 previous unknown vulnerabilities. And we've reported all those bugs to the project developer, and all of, most of them are being acknowledged. And in, in addition to the bugs, we also like draw the, use this bar chart to essentially give some insight about the distributions of different uh, bugs. So as you can see, it is not very surprising that uh, the developer actually have the most difficulty in maintaining the semantic consistency between a constraint system as well as the weakness computations. Excellent. Now we see an effectiveness of the static analyzer for capturing common ZK bugs. And let's revisit the early non to be example. As I indicated earlier, so here there's a bug um, that leads to under-constrained problems in which the developer forgot to constrain the value of the last elements in the output array. As a result, this will enable the attacker to supply the last elements with arbitrary value, and then it will still be accepted by the verifier. So suppose the developer use our tool to identify this problems, and then she suggests the following fix on the right-hand side. And what she wants to do is essentially to figure out whether the current version is indeed correct, i.e. it's actually free from under-constrained problem. In this case, we cannot just rerun the previous static analyzer and then draw the conclusion that the current circuit is safe based on the fact that the static analyzer cannot find anything. Because we know that static analysis is based on common patterns or prior knowledge. However, what the developer want right now is actually a stronger guarantee, which uh, requires doing formal verification. And this is where the last sections come into play. So before we state the solutions, I would like to revisit the under-constrained problems uh, formally. As I mentioned in the 
earlier sections of the previous slide. So basically, let's say we have a circuit that contains two parts, the witness computation P as well as the constraint system C. And both of them take X and Y as X as the input and Y as the output. And here we say that an under constraint box happens if we have a pair of X and Y such that X and Y satisfy the constraint system C. However, they are not a valid pair for program P. Okay. So in this case, what we want to do is essentially we want to formally prove that a circuit is not under constraint. And there are mul multiple solutions for doing that. And there are two naive approach is that one, you can it's essentially perform static analysis. And what we mean by static analysis is that you can it's essentially define a set of predefined rules, which allow you to reason about properties of um, signal variables. Like for instance, in this case, we have a simple circuit with input X and output Y and two uh, equations on the constraint systems. Assuming that we know that X, input X, is going to be properly constrained. And so because we know that Z is a linear combination of X and X is well constrained, as a result, Z is also constrained. And because y is a linear, com linear combination of z and x, as a result, we can conclude that y is also properly constrained. Therefore, we conclude that the entire circuit is free from under-constrained problem. And if we don't want to come up with such kind of predefined rules, a general solution is to formalize the problem as an SMT query. In this case, because the under-constrained property can be formalized as a first order logical formula in the theory of finite field. And the solver can directly answer this query. And in this case, if the solver returns a satisfiable answer, it means that it managed to found a counterexample that demonstrates the under-constraint problem. Both approach <coughs> have their pros and cons. Static and then analyzing the constraint, it's very scalable and can allow us to verify large circuits that are safely constrained. <clears throat> However, they oftentimes suffer from false positive, in that if they say that a circuit is under constraint, it might not be the case. On the other hand, SMT solver does not suffer the false positive problems because it's based on very precise uh, symbolic reasoning. It has a hard time to scale to large circuits with just a few hundreds of constraints. In this section, I'm going to propose a new system called PICAS, which takes as input a set of polynomial field equations and automatically try to verify that the circuit is well constrained. In this case, if PICAS prove P is well constrained, <coughs> it will return a check mark indicating that the circuit is safe. And it can also prove um, the circuit is under constraint that it's going to return a cross mark. If none of the above case happens, it's going to return unknown. So the key idea behind PICAS is that it combines the strength and power of static analysis and SMT, allowing it to scale to large circuits while maintaining reasonable precision. At a high level, the static anal analyze and SMT phase of PICAS interact in a loop, given each other information that allow them to make progress that they could not otherwise do on their own. And let's take a look at the details and see how it works. <clears throat> the static analysis phase of PICAS take as input polynomial field equation P along with a set of signal K that have proved to be well constrained by PICAS so far. And at the very beginning, <clears throat> the algorithm will initialize K as an empty. And given those input, the static analysis engine will generate an updated set of constraint K prime, saying that those, all the signals in those sets has to prove to be well constrained. 
So here the invariance is that k prime should always larger than k to demonstrate that at every iterations it will grow the set of signals proved to be well constrained to demonstrate that it is actually making progress. So in this case, um, if the set constraint um, is going to contain the output signal, then we are going to return a check mark, meaning that um, PiKa is going to terminate and return um, the conclusion that the circuit is properly constrained. On the other hand, because it might lead to certain scenario that cannot be reasoned uh, using static analysis, it's going to pass k prime as the input to the SMT phase. So the SMT phase has a similar interface in that it takes as input of the constraint P as well as a set K that proved to be well constrained. And it's going to return a K double prime, which essentially contain a set of signal that proved to be well constrained, as well as <clears throat> K under constraint which essentially demonstrate a set of signal that proved to be uh, under constraint. The first conditions, it's very similar to the previous one in the sense that if the output signal is going to be the subset of K prime, then we are done. In a sense that we just return that the current um, circuit is safe. And the second condition state that if any of the output signal is going to have a non-empty intersections, with the, um, with a set of signal that proved to be under constraint, then we are going to return cross, indicate that the circuit is unsafe. And in the third case, if k is actually equal to k prime, meaning that there was no way um, that the SMT solver can make progress, and then the reason for uh, that lead to this kind of situation is very much because of the limitations of existing finite field solver. In that case, we are going to return question mark indicated that um, unknown. And if none of those three cases happens, we are going to propagate those information K prime back to the static analysis phase and re repeat those process until um, the two uh, lead to a decisive answer. And here is the output of PICAS when we evaluate the two on the, the fixed version of the circuit that I mentioned earlier. As you can see, the, out, the, circ, the two is going to output certain statistics regarding the number of constraints of the, of the circuit. And then finally, it's going to print safe. And here, um, the safe meanings uh, that PICAS has formally verified that the given circuit is guaranteed to have no under-constrained signals. To evaluate the effectiveness of PICAS, we run it on 163 circuits collected from popular circuit library, including 59 from circuit YouTube and 104 from circuit core. So the table at the top um, shows uh, relevant statistics in terms of number of constraints as well as number of output signals. And as we can see, um, why the circuits in the U2 library is relatively small, the circuits in the second core library is actually very, very big. And to compare against um, the effectiveness of the two, we also compare PICAS again to baseline namely the one that just used static analysis in the middle, as well as the one that just used uh, SMT. And the blue one uh, corresponds to the result of PICAS. And here the bar chart shows the performance of three tools on two different benchmark set, namely Circum U2 as well as Circum Core. And then Y axis is essentially correspond to the percentage of benchmark that are being solved and the higher the better. And the conclusion is that PICAS consistently outperform uh, both the baseline that based on static analysis as well as SMT solver. And if you look at the chart uh, result a little bit closer, you realize that while uh, why SMT solver uh, is effective on solving simple benchmark, 
its performance actually drops dramatic, dramatically once you increase the complexity of the uh, of the circuit. That basically concludes those two projects that I mainly want to discuss today. And here I want to bring the early figure of a program verifier again. So why the idea of formal verifications is very general? It has a lot of challenges while applying to complex domains such as ZK circuits. And for instance, there are many, many open problems such as how do we express specification that involve complex crypto uh, primitives. And as we mentioned earlier, most formal verification tool rely on its underlying theorem prover for checking validity of logical formula. In that case, how can we um, design more efficient prover that can efficiently reason about finite field? They are everywhere in ZK circuit. In the case when the verifications cannot proceed in the sense that it cannot produce a valid proof, how can we actually generate concrete evidence to show the, the problematics of the circuit? And finally, as I mentioned earlier, so in this world, we mostly instantiate our techniques in the context of Silicon as well as a Halo 2. And it will be interesting and they're excited to support other systems as well as such as Plunky 2, Nova, etc. To conclude, we did a very brief survey about formal method, which provide powerful tool for ensuring software robustness. And then I went over two projects which demonstrate that how formal method can help with identifying common vulnerabilities, as well as proving the absence of certain bugs in ZK circuit. I personally believe that uh, ZK security is an extremely important topic, yet understudied by the research community. So which means that if you are interested in the problem domain, feel free to reach out to me. And there here are the references of the talk, and thank you so much for watching the lecture. Have a good day.